Psalm 61. So I invite you to please stand as we read this psalm together. To the choir master with stringed instruments of David. Hear my cry, O God. Listen to my prayer. From the end of the earth I call to you when my heart is faint. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. For you have been my refuge, a strong tower against the enemy. Let me dwell in your tent forever. Let me take refuge under the shelter of your wings. For you, O God, have heard my vows. You have given me the heritage of those who fear your name. Prolong the life of the king. May his years endure to all generations. May, be, may he be enthroned forever before God. Appoint steadfast love and faithfulness to watch over him. So will I ever sing praises to your name as I perform my vows day after day. Let us pray. Father, by the power of your word and your spirit, would you teach us how to pray this morning? For we ask in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. Christmas will never be the same for some 20 families in Newtown, Connecticut, who now have to endure the unimaginable pain of seeing those Christmas presents intended for their children sit under the tree unopened this year. The last shot that was fired on Friday took the life of the deranged gunman but when it was fired, the battle had just begun. The battle that is now raging in the lives of these families and in the life of an entire community. A spiritual battle where these victims, these families now find themselves in the trenches of spiritual war. And their experience there will either drive them closer to God or it will harden them further against Him. And the same is true for you. In your life, whatever battles you are facing, whatever trenches you are now enduring, whatever grueling warfare is raging around you or will someday rage around you, it will either serve to drive you into a deeper knowledge of God or it will drive you away from Him. This is the way of life in this present age. This is why Peter could write in 1 Peter 4, 12 and 13, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share in Christ's suffering, that you also may rejoice and be glad when His glory is revealed." This place that we find ourselves in so often, the, the trenches of war, is a place where prayer should happen. And very often when I know of some particular struggle, some particular affliction that you as individuals or as families are facing here in the church, I will pray for you along these lines. First, I will pray for the Lord to relieve your suffering and deliver you from your distress but I'll also pray that through this affliction, the Lord would draw you in to a deeper knowledge of Him than you otherwise could have had without it in your life. And I imagine that perhaps 10,000 years from now, we might all look back on that suffering, on that affliction, and thank God, not for the suffering itself, but for what He did with it. And what otherwise could not have been if it had not been part of your life. That's how I pray for you. And I know that my God will do it. David gives us a model of one who prays here 
in the trenches. And he teaches us in this prayer of Psalm 61 that in the trenches of life, we must remain confident of God's favor to us and cry out to Him for deliverance. I'll repeat that just in case you're taking notes this morning. In the trenches of life, we must remain confident of God's favor to us and cry out to Him for deliverance. When you find yourself facing afflictions, when you find the enemy attacking you on every side, when you find that your faith is being tested, do not be hardened against God. Do not withdraw from Him. Open yourself to Him. Cry out to Him so that you may know Him in a way that you never have before. As we follow along this psalm this morning, there are many ways we could try to divide it up, but I've chosen to split it right down the middle. There's a musical term, Salah, that appears at the end of verse 4, and, and it seems that that would be a good place to divide the psalm into two halves. And so we'll look at these two halves of the psalm this morning as we uh, glean from it two words of instruction for us when we are learning how to pray in the trenches of life. The first word of instruction is this, when you are in the trenches, cry out to God for deliverance. When you are in the trenches, cry out to God for deliverance in verses 1 through 4. David's situation, all we can know about it is what he tells us in verse 2. From the end of the earth, I call to you when my heart is faint. David is apparently outside of Jerusalem. He's calling out to God from the end of the earth. He's somewhere far removed from the holy place. And not only that, he's enduring some kind of suffering, some kind of, of trial that has left his heart weary and faint. Now, God doesn't tell us what the situation was. It could have been a military campaign he was on. It could have been the occasion when David was uh, forced into exile because of the rebellion of his son Absalom. We can't really know, and, and it's in God's wisdom that He's given it to us in a more general way so that it may more easily be applied to all the general circumstances of our lives as well. But we do see here that David is fighting to preserve his faith as he is distant from God, so to speak, and as he is faint of heart. So far from God and faint in heart, that would be an easy time to retreat inward into a spiritual depression. It would be an easy time to withdraw from God. It would be a very easy thing to simply turn away and wallow in self-pity. That's what I would be tempted to do. But what David shows us by his example, when he calls out to God out of the faintness of heart with the last bit of strength he has left, he shows us that prayer is not for the spiritually lazy. Prayer is hard. It is hard work, and sometimes we have to do it even when we don't have the strength to do it. He says in verse 1, Hear my cry, O God. Listen to my prayer. You know, we might think that the best times of prayer are the times when all's right with the world when we are so full of joy in God, when we are overflowing with energy to do it. And those times are wonderful. But let's be realistic. Much of our lives is not lived during those times. Much of our lives is lived here in the grueling battle of the trenches of war. And if this is where much of life is lived, this is where God intends for us to learn how to pray. And this is where God gives us a word of instruction, calling us to call out to Him in these times. So what is it that will motivate us? What will give us the strength to call out to God when we feel like we don't have the strength to do so? It's our knowledge of God. Our knowledge of who He is and what He is to us. Notice how David addresses Him throughout this psalm. Very simply, he calls Him God, verse 1, verse 5, and verse 7. This is the only name that is used for God in the entire psalm. 
It's the Hebrew word Elohim. It's really not so much a name as it is a title, a general title of, of, of a God as God. It could refer to other gods in other contexts. But in this case, he is speaking to the one true God of Israel. Not once does David employ the covenant name of God revealed to Israel, the name Yahweh. Instead, he is speaking here with the term that is used for God in Genesis 1 all throughout the creation account where it is a designation of God connoting His universal sovereignty, His lordship as creator over all of creation, not just of Israel. And so David, from the end of the earth, calls out to this one who is God, who is sovereign. As in the words of Psalm 139, if I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, behold, you are there. God is utterly inescapable. Remember that when you feel distant from Him and cry out to Him. And then notice a series of images David uses in verses 2 through 4 to speak of who God is to David to speak of God's deliverance here. He says in verse 2, at the latter half of the verse, Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. A rock would have been a refuge from the enemy in the wilderness. And a rock that is higher than I is a rock that David could not reach on his own. And so he cries out to God to lift him up to what he cannot attain by his own strength. A similar idea in verse 3, For you have been my refuge, a strong tower, against the enemy. A tower is likewise a refuge from the enemy. In fact, in 2 Chronicles 26.10, it is mentioned that King Uzziah built towers in the wilderness because he had such a great abundance of livestock. And what that indicates is that Uzziah needed his flocks to be pastured and therefore he needed to provide places of security for his shepherds. Out in the wilderness, shepherds could be open to attacks from wandering bandits. And so uh, there were occasions when shepherds would have towers built for them where they could retire in the evenings and sleep soundly, knowing that they were safe from the enemy. Perhaps David himself had slept in such a tower before. And so God is for David a rock. He is a tower. He is a refuge from the enemy, but David then switches images in his prayer of verse 4. Let me dwell in your tent forever. Here we've moved from tower to tent, from protection from the enemy to the warm embrace of a friend. The tent is a place of warmth and hospitality. It's a place of welcome. And let's not forget that when David was king, the ark of God dwelled in a tent in Jerusalem. And thus for David to desire to dwell in the tent of God is to desire to dwell in the very place of God's presence. And then the most intimate image of all at the end of verse 4, let me take refuge under the shelter of your wings. Here I can't help but think of the image that Jesus gives in Matthew 23, 37. O oh, Jerusalem! Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who were sent to it. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings. And you would not. David is not only asking for God to protect him as a rock and a tower to show him warmth and hospitality as one welcoming into his tent, but he's asking to be in God's very bosom. He is asking to be so near to God as a chick is near to its mother hen. You see, David is far from God and faint in heart, but he cries out nonetheless because of his knowledge of who this God is for him. The greatest example of one who cried out to God from the trenches is our Lord Jesus Christ, who in the Garden of Gethsemane, when He was utterly alone, His disciples couldn't even stay awake 
to keep watch and to pray with him, he entered into a raging battle that quite literally left him bleeding from his sweat glands. And in that moment, I can imagine the devil threw everything he had at Jesus in an attempt to convince him to go his own way, to abandon the will of the Father, and to seek his own interests rather than what God had given him to do. And three times Jesus called out to the Father. Three times he submitted his will to the Father. And Luke twenty two forty three tells us, And there appeared to him an angel from heaven, strengthening him. From the trenches he cried out, and he was heard by his Father. You see, prayer is often not easy. But when it feels the hardest, it may be the most needed. Because those are the times when our knowledge of God will be forged like no other times in our lives. Cry out to God for deliverance when you are in the trenches. The second word of instruction for us this morning is when you are in the trenches, cry out to God with confidence. When you are in the trenches, cry out to God with confidence. Don't just go through the motions of prayer because you think it's something you ought to do. If that's all you can muster, then do it. But, but try to raise your mind higher than that. Pray with assurance that God's favor is upon you in Christ. Martin Luther wrote in a letter dated December 12, 1533 to his friend John Schlagenhofen, I am sorry to hear that you are still depressed at times. Christ is as near to you as you are to yourself, and He will not harm you, for He shed His blood for you. Dear friend, honor this good, faithful man. Believe that he esteems and loves you more than does Dr. Luther or any other Christian. What you expect of us, expect even more of him. For what we do, we do at His command. But what He who commands us does, He does spontaneously and out of His own goodness. David provides us a model of this kind of prayer that indicates confidence in the favor of God upon him. Here in verses 5 to 8, notice that verse 5 David speaks as one who has already been delivered. He says here, For you, O God, have heard my vows. A vow was often a pledge that a person would make that accompanied some prayer request. And it was given in anticipation that that request would be answered and thus the vow would be offered in response. Think of Hannah in 1 Samuel. When she prayed for the Lord to give her a son, she said, If you give me a son, I will give him to you in the service of of the tabernacle. David is saying here, God has heard my vows, and by implication he's heard the requests that have been made with them. And it, for, for God simply to hear does not mean that he is merely aware of what David has said. It means that God has acted in response to David's prayer. And he goes on to say it at the end of verse 5, in this way, you have given me the heritage of those who fear your name. And what he means here is God has given to David the same heritage, the same inheritance that he has given to all those who fear the Lord. And what is this heritage? There are many verses we could go to to further unpack this idea of the heritage that belongs to those who fear God. But I think Psalm 37, 9 is as good as any. It says, For the evildoers shall be cut off, but those who wait for the Lord shall inherit the land. There's a land promise that runs all through Scripture. It's a promise that those who fear God will dwell in God's own dwelling place, in a land of abundance, in a land of peace, in a land of security, in a land where they will dwell with God. Forever. David says, this is already mine. You've given it to me. We saw earlier in verse 2, he is crying out to God from the end of the earth. 
And so he's, in verse 2, outside of the land. In verse 5, he says God has given him the land. What's going on here? Did he write verse 5 at a different time? I don't think so. It's possible, but I don't think so. I think David is speaking here the language of faith. He is in a personal exile from Jerusalem, a personal exile from the holy place, but he speaks as though it is his. He reaches out and takes hold by faith of what God has promised him. And we are in the exact same situation when we pray. You see, the deed to a better country, a heavenly one, is ours. It's already been given to us. And how do we know? Paul gives us an argument in Romans 8.32 that cannot be refuted. In Romans 8.32, Paul says, He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Now, in rhetoric, this is known as an a fortiori. This is an argument from the greater the more difficult to the less difficult. Think of it this way. If, if someone is able to run a mile in four minutes, then he can certainly run a mile in ten minutes. And so Paul says of God, if God has already done the greater thing, then he will certainly do the lesser thing as well. And what has he already done? He has already given his son to death for us. That's the greater thing. The infinite worth of the Son makes that the greater thing that God can do, and He has already done it. If He's already done that, then all things will most certainly be given to us for whom Christ has died. All things, a new creation that we stand to inherit that is already ours by faith. In prayer, we bridge the gap between this present age and the inheritance of that is to come. The cross of Christ is your deed to the promised land. David prays with confidence in verse 5, and then in verse 6 and 7, he switches gears a bit as he focuses now on a prayer for the king. Now, of course, David himself was the king, so is he praying here for himself? Yes, he is, but I think there's also more to it than that. Notice that these requests are really, in verses 6 and 7, larger than life. Verse 6 says, prolong the life of the king. Okay, that one's pretty normal. Yes, we want the king to have a long life. That could be applicable to David or to anyone from his line. But then the next half of the verse, may his years endure to all generations. Now here we've stepped outside of a normal lifespan. And then just to make it one step further, in verse 7 he says, May he be enthroned forever before God. So we've gone from prolong the life of the king to give him a, a reign that lasts all generations to let him be enthroned forever. What does David mean here? I think if we look to the New Testament and we look to the way Peter interprets another psalm of David we can have a clue as to how this one also ought to be interpreted. In his Pentecost sermon in Acts 2, Peter comments on Psalm 16, another psalm of David, and specifically Psalm 16, verse 10, which says, uh, David says to the Lord, You will not abandon my soul to Hades, nor will you let your Holy One see corruption. This is how Peter interprets this in Acts 2, 29-31. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. David is giving a larger-than-life prayer because he has faith in a larger-than-life promise that God has made. 
David has a prophetic faith that sees into the future that one day one of his descendants will overcome death itself and reign forever. That is the hope in Jackson, Tennessee this morning, and that is the hope for Newtown, Connecticut this morning. That Jesus Christ is an eternal King who has conquered death, who will be enthroned forever before God, just as David prays here. Why will he be enthroned forever? Because of the end of verse 7, where David asks, appoint steadfast love and faithfulness to watch over him. Now these two words, steadfast love and faithfulness, uh, the former one comes up in about every psalm I preach, steadfast love. And faithfulness, of course, is paired with that very often in the Old Testament. These are, are two terms that are a shorthand way of referring to the character of God. To His sovereign grace given to Israel, and more specifically, to the house of David. In fact, that first word, steadfast love, is used in God's promise to David in the Davidic covenant of 2 Samuel 7, verse 15, he says of David's son, My steadfast love will not depart from him as I took it away from Saul, whom I put away before you. So God rejected Saul when Saul sinned, but he will not reject the house of David. His steadfast love will endure for the house of David forever. And this is why David has hope that his throne will be occupied to all generations. Now, as I was studying this and preparing to, to craft a message from this psalm, I, I began to ask this question. How do I approach this? Do, do we look at Psalm 61 primarily a, a, as a psalm that teaches us about Christ's deliverance from death? Or is it more about our deliverance? In other words, is David here a type of Christ or is he a model who teaches us how to pray in our personal lives? And I came up to the answer. The answer is yes. Yes. Because you see, those two things are not at odds with each other. The, the deliverance of Christ from death is our deliverance from death. The deliverance of Christ is the deliverance we've already experienced in our salvation. Paul says in Ephesians 2, 4-6, But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses and sins, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with Him, and seated us with Him in the heavenly places. Our resurrection has already begun. And it is a share in the resurrection and enthronement of Christ. And it's a resurrection we will taste in fullness when He comes from heaven to call us out of our tombs. This is a psalm about Christ. This is a psalm about us because we are in Christ. David then ends on a note of praise in verse 8. So will I ever sing praises to your name as I perform my vows day after day. David here declares with confidence that he will worship God as one who has been delivered from this affliction that he faces. He will worship continually. He will have the opportunity to perform more vows unto the Lord in response to God's deliverance. Think of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. How much they had to be thankful for. They had their own existence from God. that They, they didn't bring that about. God did that. They, they were living in paradise, in a, a garden of rich abundance. They had a perfect relationship with one another. They were dwelling in God's own dwelling place. So much to be thankful for. But there is one dimension of thanksgiving they did not yet have. They could not yet be thankful to God as Redeemer. They had not yet known what it means to be rescued, to be delivered. And we do. Adam and Eve in the garden had never hung over the precipice of hell. 
had never faced the tyranny of death. And we have. And God has rescued us through His Son. Now what this shows us is that God will be more glorified when He is praised, not merely as benevolent Creator, but also as merciful Redeemer. And if that is the case, then we can be assured that God's commitment to your deliverance in Christ is every bit as high as His commitment to the glory of His name. For the glory of God and the deliverance of His people are so inextricably bound to one another that for God to act with regard to one is to, re is to act with regard to the other. So pray with confidence. God is as committed to your good as He is to the glory of His own name. I suppose that in the end, what I'm saying this morning is that we must pray from the trenches of life with the cross in view. Brian Chapel says this of the cross, We trust our sovereign God because He has shown us His heart at the cross. There, where any one of us would have stood and cried out, This is wrong, God. You must stop this. Our Savior made heaven's greatest good come out of earth's worst tragedy. At the cross, we learn that God is good and can be trusted even when everything seems wrong to human sight. To bereaved parents in Newtown, Connecticut, to a nation reeling from the worst school shooting in our history. Everything seems wrong to human sight. From a merely human standpoint, we have no reason to trust a God who did not stop this. But before we leap to that conclusion, let's remember that God also knows the pain of losing a son. John 3.16 tells us, For God so loved the world that He gave, He gave His only Son. That whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. Cry out to Him. Cry out to Him from the trenches. Cry out to the God who is revealed to you in the cross and come to a deeper knowledge of Him than you have ever known before. If you do not know this God this morning, if you have never known the joy of forgiveness of sins, I want to hold out to you the promise of Joel 2.32, Everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Call upon His name this morning and you will be saved from the wrath to come. To those of you who are believers, we invite you, believers in good standing with a local church, we invite you to come to the table and, and eat with us this morning. Come partake of the bread. Come partake of the cup. And remember once again the time when God came to us here in the trenches and gave Himself up to death in the person of His Son to purchase our inheritance in a city where He will wipe away every tear from our eyes. And death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. Would you bow and quiet your hearts before God? And let's take a moment of silence.